Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the School of Education, Dr. Penny L. Hamrick Doctoral Student Colloquium Series. My name is Dr. Michael Kozak, and I will be your moderator for this evening. We are pleased to welcome our virtual attendees, including School of Education faculty, staff, and students, the university body at large, community members, partner, partner associations, and family and friends of our colloquium presenters. The colloquium series offers School of Education doctoral students and alumni an opportunity to share their original research and learn from their peers, faculty, and staff. Each month, one EDD and one PhD student present their research at the colloquium. These sessions help doctoral students connect and develop a peer community that is invaluable in supporting their journeys in the program. Each doctoral student or alumni presenter is also asked to write a research brief that relates to their presentation, which is then included in an edited publication titled Doctoral Student Research Briefs, published on the School of Education's website. The research brief is a way to disseminate our doctoral students' research as shared in the colloquium in a concise format with relevance to education. Tonight, each presenter will be provided with 20 minutes to share the research. We will then move on to question and answers following each presentation. Please save your questions for the end. You are welcome to type your questions in the chat or raise your virtual hand, which is located in the uh, reaction tab, there should be a raised hand feature if you have a question to ask. Our first presenter is George Schaefer, a PhD student in the School of Education. George is a current second year PhD student working with Dr. Christopher Wright in the School of Education. George has a bachelor's degree in astronomy and physics and a master's degree in leadership in higher education. Their academic work focuses on how universities and communities collaborate in out-of-school spaces to engage young people in science. Specifically, George's research agenda aims to improve such partnerships and provide more equitable, reciprocal forms of engagement to create better science learning experiences for youth and adults alike. Tonight, George will be speaking about unearthing crops, a systemic integrative literature review of community-based reciprocal out-of-school programs in STEM. I now present George Schaefer. Thank you so much for that introduction. And let me go ahead and pull up my presentation for you all. Can folks see that okay? All right, thank you so much. Again, thanks for the introduction. And um, just wanna say thanks to everyone for being here. Um, I know many of you have had a long day of class, work or whatever. Some of you might be eating dinner, driving home right now. So I just really appreciate you taking the time to be here. So yes, uh, I will be discussing a systematic literature review that I have been working on. It's kind of in its initial draft stages and I'm excited to engage with you all around that. and get feedback. That's honestly what I'm most excited about tonight. This is an overview of what I'll be covering here. So the context of the study, the conceptual framework being used, the purpose and the methods, findings, and a conclusion, and then a chance for that feedback and Q&A. So for the context of this study, generally, this is a systematic review of research literature about K-12 out-of-school science programs, and specifically looking at those which have a partnership of some kind between university and community. And it utilizes a novel conceptual framework that is called CROPS that I'll talk more about. That stands for Community-Based Reciprocal Out-of-School Programs in STEM. The motivation for this study comes both from my personal experience in engaging in a lot of these programs in a variety of ways, as well as um, literature about out-of-schools and community-based learning. So, Research has shown that upwards or around 80% of the time that youth are engaging in learning is outside of the classroom. There are also inequities around STEM education and access to out-of-school learning that um, exist across various dimensions. There is also an opportunity for universities to be involved in these kinds of programs in a way that can address those inequities if done in certain ways. 
And there is also a need for more expansive research around those kinds of things. For me personally, um, as mentioned, my research agenda is looking at a large scale around these kinds of programs. So for example, looking not just at one or two individual programs, but how, for example, Drexel as a whole engages in these kinds of things. This literature review took a systematic and integrative approach. So carefully examining key terms to find certain articles and bring in those interdisciplinary concepts. For context, there have been other literature reviews that have talked about things like STEM outreach, engineering education, STEM clubs, and university community partnerships, but no known work to date has synthesized these areas in the way that I'm trying to here. So for the conceptual framework, I have put forth this model of crops, which is not only just a much shorter way to say community-based reciprocal out of school programs in STEM, but it also represents what I hope is a more holistic approach to how to engage in such things. So I'm gonna go through each of these components briefly to kind of frame what I mean. Community is something that is often very nebulous or very hard to define or not defined very well, but I'm trying to frame community as expansive and inclusive and not just talking about community as some sort of locality or geography, but as distinct from just being out of school and also distinct from research that historically may be framed as for the community or on the community and trying to center more equitable approaches such as being with community and in community. The idea of reciprocity I think is really important to this framework because universities have a long history of injustice when it comes to community engagement and frames like politicized trust and critical relationality can move towards more equitable ways to engage. And it also represents mutuality. So especially in the kinds of programs that I'm talking about tonight, there is a lot of language around, we are doing this thing and bringing it to this community and yay for us, but that doesn't center any sort of mutuality around how universities can learn when with and in communities. And in the mutual aspect can shift power dynamics as well. And finally, as a concept, reciprocity is just not studied very much or studied very well. So this is also aiming to that research need. Out of school spaces are really unique because of course they are distinct from school spaces, but they provide lots of benefits. They have more flexibility and creativity in the way that they can have their programs designed. Um, you can interact with people that maybe you wouldn't get a chance to in just a school space. And there's lots of work showing that they can also be specifically tailored to foster positive identity development or affirmation. And finally, STEM is another thing that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Some folks say it is just a set of concepts. Other people argue that it is a marginalizing neoliberal tool that perpetuates injustice and furthers capitalist agendas. But however you wanna frame it, STEM exists, it's a part of our world, and there are inequities that exist across all levels of education and in career spaces that need to be addressed. So to kind of summarize, PROPS is being used to understand how research articles pick up these concepts and examine those framings in a sort of holistic way. Next, I'll talk about the purpose and the methods. Again, the purpose here is a literature review that is looking for published research articles discussing these topics. There are four main research questions here. The first being how many of these articles have been published recently, and I'm defining that as since 2004, and what is the purpose of each of these articles? Number two, how are each of the components of the framework crops taken up in these articles? Number three, what is the methodological, methodological approach of each article? And number four, what are the trends across the articles? Systematic and integrative literature review approaches were taken as a way to intentionally find articles and use a specific approach. The PRISMA framework was also used for the system, systematic aspect of this. And the integrative component was used again 
in that interdisciplinary way to look across and between these topics. The process that was used was a database search for articles between 2004 and 2023 that were peer reviewed and discussed United States education context, just to keep it within this specific sort of dynamic. And the main criteria were that, again, there needed to be a partnership between university and community, and there needed to be some sort of program that was STEM related with K-12 youth. Reciprocity was not a hard criteria because as I mentioned, this is something that's not studied very much. And I knew that if that was included, there would be very few research articles that would be studied. This is a visual of the systematic process that was used. So the initial search yielded 632 articles. All of those titles and abstracts were first reviewed to see if they met the inclusion criteria and that eliminated 584. And the remaining articles in the secondary pool were read completely to again, double check for those inclusion criteria. And from here, 32 were removed based on three reasons, the site or the location, meaning that they were not um, solely in an out of school space, the length, some of the articles were so short that it really didn't give enough information for in-depth analysis. And the audience, in some cases, K-12 youth were not the only or the primary focus of the study. And so that left 16 articles for final and in-depth analysis. Each of these articles was read between two and how many times, I don't know. I've developed very personal and interesting, unique relationships with all these articles, having gone through them a number of times. But an Excel sheet was used for the general organization, note taking, some preliminary coding to keep all these things organized. The coding that was used was mainly descriptive and thematic coding, utilizing the COPS framework for the second research question and generally for those other research questions. So I'd like to present some selected findings because this is, again, a literature review and there are a lot of findings. So I'll try to keep it somewhat brief and focused here, but I'm going to go through each of the research questions as a way to do that. So again, there were 16 articles, and I just want to stress that this is a systemic process, which means it's one way to look at this. So I'm not trying to claim that these are all the articles that could be found, but these are the ones that I found for this process. So the purposes of the articles were primarily to describe their programs, meaning the article's tone was basically, here's a program, let me tell you about it, a lot of the different things that we did. And there were sort of two main subcategories for that. There was integrated analysis, which by that I mean, they talk about the program and they do something else, which was typically a survey that maybe measured perceptions or opinions around the program or looked at learning before and after. There were also a few sort of how-to or model articles which said, here's our program and here's maybe the purpose being how you could also do it. And there were a couple of others that didn't really fit these categories. For the components of the CROPS framework, I'll go through those one by one real quick. The idea of community was often used really vaguely. Um, not very many articles really intentionally and in detail defined what they meant. So maybe the phrases like giving back to the community were used without really telling us who the community was. Some detailed examples were, for example, one paper that used the Latino community and very clearly articulated that as their area of focus, or a, another study developed this idea of community intentions in a tool that they were validating and developing. The idea of reciprocity, as I mentioned, unsurprisingly, was not really discussed. Um, there was one explicit use of the term that wasn't really within the context of the larger program. And other terms were used, like mutual and those kinds of things. But again, they were not really a very strong focus of the study and weren't really talked about in depth. The idea of out of school was taken up in different ways. Um, a lot of programs took place at the university, which was interesting to learn about, but a lot of them didn't really say where. So I didn't know if it was in one place or multiple places, or if it was in classrooms or laboratory spaces. And other programs that were in an after school setting may have used that terminology, but again, also did not specify where that was. If it was in a school after hours, 
or somewhere else. And there were three main ways that STEM was kind of taken up in these programs. There was a holistic approach, such as the Science Olympiad, which kind of had all kinds of STEM. There were interdisciplinary approaches where, for example, a NASA summer camp would talk about engineering and physics and other concepts. And there were also singular approaches, such as a physics program and a computer science program. For the methods, I think this was honestly one of the most interesting findings because again, these were peer reviewed articles and they use their method sections mostly just to talk about here's the program we made and here's how it worked. Um, but there weren't a lot of citations there. There weren't a lot of design based um, pollings from other research. And the other thing that was really interesting is that often surveys were used but there was not really a discussion of how those were developed, if they were validated, what other surveys that were being cited as reliable methods to assess. It was usually just, let's gather a lot of data and we're gonna tell you about it. And there were also some articles that just straight up had no method sections. There were some really clear discussions of methods in what I would say was four articles. Most of them were mixed methods. Um, and it was really cool to see different things like examinations of youth staff relationships or stakeholder conceptions of STEM clubs. And finally, the trends. The participants was one of the trends that was, that stood out. Um, typically, the ages of the youth that engaged in these programs were between about 10 and 18 years. There were also a lot of undergrad and graduate students that were mentors or, or um, facilitators or volunteers. And there were a lot of different ways that engagement was presented. So lectures and presentations and activities were pretty common, but um, across most of the articles, they went into a lot of detail, um, not always in every single aspect, but it was really encouraging to see that. And finally, like I said, a lot of these were on university campuses and a lot of them integrated university campus tours or engagement across the university space, which was cool to see. So to wrap up, the major takeaways I think are that, um, as I mentioned, community and reciprocity are, are kind of elusive terms. And I just mean that in the sense of they have a lot of meanings, but also they're not taken up um, very clearly in a lot of these articles. There's also a lot of presumptions around what constitutes methods in these articles. That was again, one of the most surprising findings to me. And it was really great to see how many different kinds of approaches to STEM there were. There really wasn't any sort of discipline that was more common. There really was all kinds of different subjects and areas. And I think some of the implications of this is that um, a lot of things are being published around here, but it doesn't seem like a lot of people are listening to one another or pulling from one another to cite one another and learn from those published programs. So I'm interested to learn more about that. And this work is complex and details are important. I know that publications have limits on how long you can have your article, but um, detail would have been really helpful. And real quick, limitations. This was one approach. I am one person. There's a lot of other ways this could have been taken up. And other studies could benefit from utilizing crops for other studies that aren't just literature reviews. And again, there are other search terms and frameworks that could be used to do a literature review of this style. So finally, the part I'm most excited for. I would love to know if there's anything else that you would have liked to see as part of the analysis or the findings. Uh, again, I have a lot of data, a lot of things I can look for, and also just love general feedback about the conceptual framework, how that was integrated, and what might be better about that. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you, George. That was that was an excellent presentation. Does that, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can either enter them in the chat or you can just really unmute and ask your questions. There's a lot of people here to try to monitor the um, question and answer section. I have. Excuse me. <clears throat> it's. I, I enjoy the presentation very much and quite interesting. I, I'm curious about, is this common in the research that you're doing, George, that the 20 years span is considered to be uh, recent? And 
of the and further after you did all of the uh calling down of the research and you came down to the final number of uh, articles what is the time span of, of those um of the articles because i 20 years to me so much happens over that period of time and with the technology and things and the research i was just curious whether any of that comes into play in terms of the way that you look at the articles? Yeah, thank you. Those are great questions. Um, as far as the time span, um, I think similar approaches have been taken in some of the other literature reviews, but um, I have seen some that do examine just like 10 years. So um, I think I think part of it is that um, some of the research suggests that like STEM as a concept really has, has emerged or become more prominent since maybe around 1990, 2000, other science folks, please correct me if I'm missing the mark on that. Um, and as far as, if I'm understanding your second question, are, are you kind of asking like the, the distribution of kind of where more of the papers right. were concentrated? Yeah, I think a lot more of them were concentrated um, towards 2010 and on. Um, I, the main, I would have to go back and look specifically, but I think the main there were a lot more of them in the sort of latter half of that time period. Is there any uh, plan on taking, dissecting it even further down to uh, the content beyond what you did already to see whether in the newer articles a certain type of approach is being taken? Is I mean, is there a trend in the way that they're dealing uh, with the subject in the, in the schools? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't generally think so, but I think now that you've asked that question, I do wanna kind of go back and pay a little more attention to the years. Um, I will say that I think the more exemplar articles, the ones that I personally liked more, um, but also that I think were a little more methodologically and conceptually rigorous, did tend to appear um, after like 2020. But I'm going to take a look through that a little more. Thank you for that. Thank you. Well, we still have time for some more questions. And uh, George, just so you know, there, you're receiving a lot of very complimentary uh, comments in the in the chat. So uh, you'll have a chance to look at that later, I'm sure. But So I believe this question is from Dr. Wright, and I would ask if you could, if you would just like to unmute and uh, ask your question. Or it says Christopher, so I, maybe I'm making an assumption here. Okay, so I will ask the question. In the chat, it says, I know that the word reciproc reciprocity was not utilized throughout your search, however, did you find that universities were attending to the needs of the community? How was this balanced with the need to teach STEM? I think that's a great way to sort of conceptualize or reconceptualize that. And kind of similar to how I discussed around community, there were some ways that that was a little more prevalent. And I think that the framings around why the work was being done was often um, for community benefit, even though that may not have been very clearly articulated, or at least maybe not to my standards as someone <laughs> very deeply steeped in this um, area. But um, I think that often there was a narrative around, um, you know, things like bringing science to the community or engaging um, with people in the surrounding area in that way. Chris couldn't unmute. I think his kids are doing STEM projects and having a lot of fun in the background, but that's, uh, so you still have time if you want to elaborate on that anymore. I 
actually I noticed one more one more question so I can go sure. ahead and go ahead. and take that um around um using this research to conceptualize a new type of organization to deliver this um I mean my dream is that uh, more universities would have a more centralized area for um university engagement and specifically around STEM so oh. that's that's the ambitious thought <laughs> to answer that question but I think just kind of this general approach and the conceptual approach can can hopefully be utilized um, in a way that doesn't necessarily have to have a central organization because um, a lot of this kind of research um, or these programs do kind of exist in siloed settings, um, especially at universities. It's often just a professor or a group of graduate students that do this kind of stuff. And so I would love to see that uh, have more of an interconnected sense of that at universities and of course with communities, but I know that's ambitious. All right, well, if we have no other questions or comments, then I uh, will take the next couple minutes to, we'll, to transition. And uh, George, I would have to ask if you would please stop sharing. There you go, perfect. And I would ask also that maybe we gave a virtual round of applause to uh, George for an excellent presentation. Okay, just checking everything here, great. All right, our second presenter is Valdesia Ambrose Brown, an alumnus of the EDD program in the School of Education. Dr. Valdesia Deesh Ambrose Brown is a mother of two amazing young women, wife, researcher, scholar, and educational practitioner who has made her career in higher education ecologies. <clears throat> her experience in higher education spans diverse colleges and universities and centers on teaching, learning, student success, and belonging. Dr. Deesh's academic and research interests include the neuroscience of learning, creativity, and arts integration, neuroprotective embodied practices, and neurophysiological and neuropsychological implications of racial stress on learner and educational practitioner well-being. Dr. Deesh holds an EDD from Drexel University with a concentration in mind, brain, and learning science, a master's in higher, higher education with concentrations in academic development, technology, and instruction in student development and affairs, a master of social work from Temple University, and her undergraduate degree in psychology from Millersville University. Tonight, Dr. Deesh will be presenting Call to Teach, an explanatory sequential study of racism-related stress and Black women's well-being in higher education ecologies. Now I present Dr. Deesh. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Kozak, for that introduction, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to just uh, thank my dissertation committee, um, my uh, supervising professor, Dr. Larry Kaiser, uh, Dr. Kristen Betts, and Dr. Ross Anderson of the Creative Engagement Lab in Oregon um, for being thought partners and for helping to steer the course, um, their expertise, their wisdom, their um, research expertise that helped me to complete my doctorate at Drexel, so I'm very thankful for that. I'd also like to thank Dr. Deanna Hill for always being um, a, a mentor and a supporter, and uh, to thank my family, my husband and my daughters. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and jump right into uh, my research. Um, and so what I want to do is first frame um, how I got to this point. Uh, I spent about um, the first two years of my doctoral studies on another research topic. And um, entering my third year of doctoral studies, I uh, was working on a project, um, a conference presentation with a cohort mate, and came upon the research of um, Resmaa Minikin that takes a look at um, racialized stress 
and what happens in the body. I also uh, came across the research of uh, Fani, who looks at, um, she's a neuroscientist and looks at what happens in the brain uh, when exposed to racial discrimination and prejudice. And then I also looked at the work of Dr. Uh, Cynthia Dillard, who takes a look at um, Black women in, in education and ultimately um, what she talks about is this idea of dismemberment and the need to remember. So just to uh, frame where I'm going to uh, this evening in, um, in, I'm sorry, in uh, my presentation. Okay. <laughs> So first, I'd like to um, just share some key terms with you this evening uh, in the sense of um, providing a research overview. I uh, will then transition into just talking about the purpose of my research and the significance. I will center my research questions, there are four. Talk a little bit about the theoretical framework. How did I collect my data? What were some of the um, key findings as related to my research questions? and then the recommendations that were put forth from my research. So key terms. The first uh, key term is massage noir. And really that is a intense dislike of, of black women. And because of that, um, oftentimes uh, black women uh, faculty may enter a space and may have a visceral response to that space. And what we would call that is, that response is um, embodied cognition. Ultimately, it is the body's ability to measure the depth of an experience um, more quickly and more precisely than um, it's totally conceived of in the mind. Um, from that, what happens, um, we know that that flight, or fi that flight or fight response that Black women have, um, that's, that happens in the amygdala or the amygdalae because it's in both hemispheres of the brain. This exposure to um, chronic stress um, and uh, racial stress ultimately adds to a person's allostatic load and because of the adding of that allostatic, adding to the allostatic load, it can lead to a, a condition called weathering. And so weathering is where the telomeres, which are at the ends of chromosomes, um, and everyone has, um, of course, chromosomes, everyone has telomeres, but ultimately telomeres tell the biological age of a person. And so what um, research studies have found is that for those who experience um, chronic and ongoing uh, racism, that their telomeres are actually shortened. And so why is this so important? It's important because that means that the lifespan of the individual is also shortened. So thinking about um, the fact that these experiences are written onto the DNA, that would be considered epigenetics. And it's epigenetics that tells us that the impacts of racial trauma and racial stress ultimately can be passed down uh, generation to generation. And so, as I mentioned in the beginning, thinking about this uh, dismembering of, of its black people, but my research specifically takes a look at um, black women faculty. This dismembering ultimately requires the act of remembering. And so uh, my research takes a look at, you know, how to uh, begin that process specifically through looking at embodied practices and beginning to, to lay the foundation for um, black women being able to move toward wholeness. So the purpose of my research was to take a look at and understand the experience of black women faculty um, in higher education, specifically at predominantly white institutions. It was, um, the question that I was putting forward is, would an understanding of, um, would an understanding of, of embodied practices and an understanding of racism and what happens in the body and what happens in the brain, could that in fact have an impact on um, these women, on their awareness and ultimately on their ability to be able to move toward wholeness? So 
and why is this significant? So in, in higher education, ultimately we know, um, I won't say we know, but ultimately that it's in these environments when black women have to enter these environments um, and it's an ongoing experience that it can have or result in negative health um, impacts. And so trying to find um, and thinking about when you're on an airplane. So my research did not, I considered it, but it did not take a look at how to uh, create systemic change. So how to work within a higher education institution to change the, the climate and such. Um, but it looked more at the personal level with um, black women with the thought that um, what we hear about when we get, take a, a, a plane trip, a, a flight, where the um, where we're told to put on our oxygen mask first, and so that's where this um, the thought of first trying to get to women to educate them about um, racial racial um, racialized stress, what happens in the body, what happens in the brain, and then exposing them to um, embodied practices that ultimately could that in fact help to serve as a neuroprotective. Um, could they serve as neuroprotective tools? So I had four research questions. Um, to what extent did Black women faculty in higher education at predominantly white institutions experience racism-related stress? There's an A part of that question. Um, for study participants who experienced racism-related stress, what negative health outcomes did they report? My second question was, to what extent did Black women faculty and PWIs report using embodied practices to cope with racism-related stress? My fourth question, third question, I apologize. How did Black women faculty and PWIs describe their experience learning about racism-related stress and in incorporating embodied practices from the professional development module? And so there's a one-hour professional development module that was created. Uh, for study participants who expressed a change in their stress response, to which aspect of the intervention did they attribute the change? And then finally, my fourth question, how did study participants consider using or adapting embodied practices in the future? My um, conceptual framework, uh, took a look at three different um, lenses. Uh, first, taking a look at you know what happens in the body with racism-related stress. So specifically, looking around racial trauma um, and microaggression, and then as I indicated, um, the uh, research of the neuroscience, um, funny ultimately looking at neuroarchitecture in the brain. I uh, considered um, embodied cognition um, and looked at that through the lens of endarkened feminism, which is uh, by Dr. Cynthia Dillard, looking at the wisdom of the body, embodied cognition, um, and then the neurosociological theory of situated cognition. So thinking about trauma release or how to work that trauma out of the body and how to um, engage women in relearning or reconnecting to themselves, looked at the work of uh, Dr. Dillard around remembering um, body center practices, Resma Minikin, which I um, term as embodied um, practices, and then uh, this idea of radical self-care, which is put forth by Bell Hooks. So the data collection involved um, several different uh, elements. So in the initial phase, um, IRB and being approved and um, getting consent from individuals to participate in the study, my survey We collected data around the demographics measured through the WPDI, which is a, a validated inventory that was used. Ultimately, women, um, the, the greatest score would have been a 70 on that inventory. So the higher the score, the more exposure to uh, racism and discrimination. I also utilized a health inventory, which uh, came from Fani, and that was specifically looking at um, 
several different health factors uh, such as um, uh, excessive obese, ex excessive weight, um, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart attack. So those things were gathered through the health inventory. And then it asked uh, the uh, participant about embodied practices. Uh, did they engage in any type of embodied practice? So as I said, since this was a mixed method explanatory sequential design, um, based upon my survey data, I then uh, asked women if they would like to participate, if they met the eligibility criteria, if they'd like to um, engage in the intervention phase of the uh, study. And in that um, phase, I developed a professional development module, a one hour professional development module that taught women about um, racial um, racism related stress. It gave them some basics about uh, the understanding of the brain and how the brain functions, um, the exposure to what racism uh, related stress does in the body. It also provided an introduction to meditative practices. And after um, that exposure, women um, were able to engage in 15 days of journaling uh, in which they used a, met a metaphorical deck to prompt their writing each day. And then they had an opportunity to choose which meditative practice they wanted to engage in. So there were three meditative practices. One was uh, meditative writing, the other meditative drawing, and then the third was meditative movement. Uh, I did a, um, a pre-interview before they actually completed the pro professional development module just to gather information about their experiences in the workplace. And then following um, the professional development module and the 15 days of practices, I came back and I did a, a post-intervention interview. And um, from that, uh, I then moved into a, um, I had three women who actually continued into the intervention phase. Uh, I've named them Rochelle, Kyra, and Sandra. And I'd just like to share a little bit about, um, because of time, I'm just gonna touch on one, um, and that's sharing about um, Sandra. And so Sandra had a, a score on the WPDI of 61. And if you remember, I said on the WPDI, the highest score was a 70. And so this is a woman who uh, works at a four year uh, private institution who uh, had experienced significant um, racism related stress in her workplace. But Sandra, in her ranking um, on the WPDI, she scored a seven on, um, on five of the inventory um, items. One, that there is um, discrimination where I work. Where I work, members of some racial ethnic groups are treated better than other members. At work, minority employees receive fewer opportunities. Supervisors scrutinize the work of members of my group more than members of other racial groups. And at my present place of employment, people of other race, race um, or ethnic groups do not tell me job related information that they share with other members of their own group. And then finally, um, conversely, Sandra assigned the lowest possible rating of a one to the item that says where I work, all people are treated the same regardless of their race or ethnic group. On the inventory that asked about um, health um, experiences with negative health outcomes, Sandra indicated that within the last year, she had experienced excessive body weight. She experienced anxiety, sleeplessness, and high blood pressure. And uh, what she actually said about uh, sleeplessness was that um, on Sunday evenings, she would, um, you know, she had insomnia on, on Sunday evenings. Every Sunday when she had to go back into work, she would experience insomnia. And so um, during the time of the um, study, she actually moved to a new place of employment and the experience um, had uh, seemed to be different for her there. So in thinking about um, the key findings of my study, I'm um, thinking from the first, answering the first research question, to what extent did 
faculty in higher education at predominantly white institutions experience racism related stress. And uh, what I found here was that even though the mean score for the two, for the three participants were kind of in the middle, 5.33, 5.0, and a 5.33, ultimately when doing the uh, actual um, interviews, the pre and post interviews, it seemed that the uh, their experience was incongruent with that ranking. And so their experiences with racism related stress were much more significant than uh, their uh, their score on the inventory would have um, have would have had you to believe. All had experienced um, negative health outcomes uh, at the um, time, and uh, just to give you some idea about, there were eleven survey participants, and of those eleven participants. About 50% of them responded that they had experienced anxiety within the past year, 20% um, within the last two years and 10% within the past five years. So really that's like 80% of these respondents had experienced anxiety that they attributed to racism related stress when they're in their workplace. 27% of the women had experienced chronic headaches over the last uh, one to three years. Um, and just want to remind you, so these negative health outcomes are those that are associated with the research of Fani, who's the neuroscientist that's connected um, the impact of racism to negative health outcomes. 73% uh, of the women were currently experiencing being overweight. Um, but ultimately, 91% of the respondents uh, had reported being overweight at some point in time over the last five years. 54% of the respondents indicated that they had experienced sleeplessness within the last five years. And that sleeplessness um, has a lot to do with rumination um, that happens from this experience where the individual is um, basically reliving the experience. And so that can, that can cause sleeplessness. Um, and 27% of the respondents were currently experiencing sleeplessness. So I did a case study comparison of the three uh, individuals that went through the participants that went through the intervention. And there were four themes that emerged um, that are related to racism related stress that only is a, is a lonely place. Um, basically that there is um, a psychological implication to being the only black woman in your workplace uh, or in, in your department within your institution and that that carries a burden with it. Eating myself to death was to express the emotional burden that these women may feel where they're uh, turned to comfort food, uh, to comfort themselves. Massage noir is that physiological understanding that um, when you perceive that you're disliked, that your body has a response to that. And that, that um, release of cortisol into the body takes a, a toll and we call that toll weathering. Uh, and then rumination is this idea of what's happening in the brain as the person relives that experience. And ultimately we know that that does impact brain health. For research question two, um, that asked uh, to what extent do black women faculty and PWIs report using embodied practices to cope with racism related stress. And so on the inventory, everyone said that they uh, had used at least one of the practices, but what um, the study found was that uh, for the three um, persons of the case study, that it wasn't until about 15 years into their tenure of teaching that they actually started to use the embodied practice as a way to release racism related stress and also to uh, manage uh, coping with uh, emotional eating. However, from the um, exposure to the prof uh, professional development module, each of the women learned new strategies and they uh, adopted um, these strategies. And so this here uh, image is just showing what um, practices were uh, on the inventory, and then what percentage of the women were engaging in those practices before the uh, intervention. 
Research question three asked, how did black women faculty and PWIs describe their experience learning about racism related stress and incorporating embodied practices from the professional development module? And then there's a part A to that question for study participants who expressed a change in their stress response to which aspect of the intervention did they attribute the change? And so um, each of the women felt that while they, you know, knew about racism, that having the opportunity to connect um, that understanding to empirical research and um, that ultimately created a deeper awareness for them about racism, um, and, but then really uh, helped to magnify their understanding around the impact of racism related stress because being able to connect that stress to actual um, health outcomes uh, helped to deepen their awareness. Um, and so from the uh, module, they ultimately identified new uh, strategies that they would be able to use to work that stress out of their body. And so just if you remember, the um, work of Resmo Minikin says that uh, this trauma that's in the body has to be worked out. And so engaging in these practices are, are um, an opportunity to work that stress out. And then for research question four, how did study participants consider using or adapting embodied practices in the future? So each of the women said that they would, um, they were committed to continuing the embodied practice, but each of them found um, they were attracted to different uh, um, strategies. So one person was uh, really enjoyed using the metaphorical deck and, and writing another who uh, enjoyed the writing and actually coming up with her own drawings. And then the third person really enjoyed um, being able to do the meditative movement. And that particular, um, that would have been Rochelle who indicated not only was she benefiting from it, but she felt it was important to um, start to teach her daughter these strategies uh, so that um, she could have this uh, at her in her toolkit. Um, Rochelle also had indicated that her mother was an educator while she wasn't a higher edu education educator, she was an educator and had experienced significant um, uh, racism related stress and is currently experiencing a neurodegenerative um, disorder. And so one of the things that she said was, you know, what if her mother had had access to this information or access uh, to these tools, you know, could things have been uh, different for her um, developing a neurodegenerative disease? And so the recommendations, um, you know, institutions of higher education really um, should consider campus-wide professional development for um, Black women. Um, ultimately, it allows to create a, allows for the creation of awareness, but it also allows for the creation of space where uh, these women are able to make a connection with one another and, and to support each other. Um, ultimately, uh, Rochelle and her story. Uh, a lot of the racism related stress that she experienced, what didn't come um, necessarily from colleagues, even though it was at that level, but it was most um, significantly felt in the classroom from students. And so, you know, there's an opportunity also to engage students in an understanding about um, racism related stress. And um, the work of Resma Minikin says, you know, that the trauma um, of racism related stress isn't just carried in the genes of black people, but also um, those who perpetrate it. And so uh, that, you know, could be a, a good um, way of creating awareness. And this idea of um, collaborative relearning, as I mentioned about creating spaces where black women can um, connect with each other, uh, but then also this idea of relearning because dismemberment um, really centered around the uh, en enslavement, ultimately where, um, you know, language was taken, culture was taken, identity was taken. And so relearning is really about um, future research that I'm working on right now. And that is about going um, to Africa for black women and reconnecting to um, the land, the um, land, identity, people as a way of healing um, self. To um, 
the next recommendation is about inviting uh, black women to the table. And if there's no chair there, that one would be fabricated for them. And it's ultimately, that's just about ensuring that black women's voices are heard um, in decisions and that their, their voice is not um, squelched. And then finally, creating um, a campus climate and culture that encourages remembering, you know, how do we help um, black women to, you know, move toward flourishing and well-being. And so uh, just to conclude, um, for my thought partners, since um, I've completed my dissertation, I'm just um, asking if, uh, so like, what are some of the suggested ways that I could build on this research? How might I replicate this research within other types of institutes, um, institutions of higher education? And I specifically say that because one of the um, uh, survey respondents who had the highest score was actually at an HBCU. And so, you know, how might um, I uh, replicate this research in, in other types of um, uh, higher education environments? And are there any uh, new research questions that come to mind from this research? So I just wanna thank you very much for this opportunity. And my um, contact information is there if you'd like to um, ask any additional questions or if you'd like to uh, read my dissertation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Valdesia Ambrose Brown. Uh, that was a fascinating presentation. And at this time, I would like to open up the floor to any questions. Again, you can unmute and ask your questions, or if you would like to uh, type them in the chat, please uh, feel free to do that uh, also. So there's a question here. Okay, they're coming in quick. <laughs> From Cassie <laughs> Pierre Joseph. Uh, did you find that transgenerational trauma impacted their, the, their epigenetics? So I didn't look at that in my research. Um, yeah, so I, I did not look at that um, in my research, in my current research. Okay. Um, you can, you're getting plenty of positive comments in the chat, which you can probably <laughs> see. Again, if anyone has a question, please feel free to just unmute and ask your question, or if you want to add a comment. Uh, I had a, a question. Um, Valdisha, this was a great topic, and it, you researched it very thoroughly. I had a lot of questions bouncing around, and you answered them every time I was thinking about them. But one question I had, the telomere piece really was interesting to me. Is there a way, and I don't know if you covered this in your research, to if there you find that they're shortened because of stress and over a long period of time, that there are things you can do to um, grow them again. Are, are they regenerative? Hmm. So yeah, so thank you so much, um, Sonia. I did not look at that, um, so I, I can't answer that question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not certain, but I mean, I'd be happy to take a look at it, but I, I didn't, my research didn't take a look at it, if they're regenerative. Thank you. So one of the things that was, um, that limited my research because originally one of the things that I wanted to do was actually to use um, the fMRI technology. But, you know, one, um, as Dr. Kaiser said, I've got a very small window of time to get this dissertation done. Um, and then the other thing was cost. And so um, definitely future research, I would like to move in that direction to really understand um, you know, more of the, the health side of things. And so definitely, you know, um, looking at um, that question that you posed, Sonia, around the telomeres would be a very um, fascinating place, uh, you know, to, to start to take a look at those things. 
So it brings together my background in the biological sciences. So that's where all of that interest in, in science comes from. Uh, I, I have a question. Given that you found that, uh, given all the genetics that it can transfer down generational, did your study, I know it focused on women, but did you find any correlation with uh, Black men uh, and how it affects, how stress affects them in that same manner or not in PWI workspace? Well, you know, I, I should have um, offered a disclaimer. So this is the experience of Black, pe black people. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so the, the findings would be similar for uh, Black men working in, in um, a PWI. And so, um, yeah, so when I read, when I looked at things um, with my research, you know, it, it really, you know, did speak to, to that. All right. Well, we don't have any other questions or comments. I would like to uh, thank both of our presenters tonight and um, both George and Valdesia. And uh, thank you for coming on and thank you for everyone who attended the event. And on behalf of the School of Education, uh, again, thank you to everyone. And also know that the colloquium, colloquium series occurs on the first Monday of the month from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. The next colloquium event will be on March 4th, 2024. So mark your calendars. With that, thank you and have a great night. Thank you.